Hello, everyone. Happy International Building Designers Day. This is super exciting. I am just going to share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yep, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. So I would like to start off my presentation with a story. I love stories. And there's a story that my dad really likes to tell. So he tells this story of a curious and, let's say, slightly relentless child. It was me <laughs> wanting to explore a local wheat field. He said that day after day, I would run up towards this wheat field where we lived in the countryside, almost as though I was being pulled by something. He said I would do this day after day and being a responsible parent, he would, of course, stop me. But one day his friend suggested that he just let me go. Just let me go wander through the wheat field and see what it was that I so desperately wanted to do or see. So he did. And he said he followed close behind as I sort of just marched into that wheat field. And he said he could see the top of the wheat moving as this tiny little toddler was trudging through. And then he said that the movement stopped and he desperately ducked down through the wheat to see what it was that I was doing. And I was just sitting. I was just sitting. I wasn't crying, I wasn't laughing, I wasn't lost, I wasn't even playing, I was just sitting. A very content little human being completely surrounded by the natural world. Now this story always makes me laugh because it still describes me to a T, you know, give me a little plot of nature to plonk in and I am completely set. It rejuvenates me, it fills me with peace and it just reminds me how important it is to connect, to connect with other living things. You know, we all crave nature. We might not be as stubborn or determined as toddler Matilda, but I know that in one way or another, we all feel that pull. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Chris. So my name is Matilda Martin. I have a degree in interior architecture and what some might describe as a fierce passion for the environment. So when I was introduced to the theory of biophilia, well, I knew it was going to play a really big role in my life. Now, biophilia, you say, what a strange word, <laughs> but broken up, it's pretty simple. So let's break it up in half. Bio meaning life or living things, and philia means the intense love of something. So simply put, biophilia just means the love of living things. And it's a theory based on the idea that humans have this innate urge to affiliate with other forms of life. So the urge to affiliate with other forms of life, so being surrounded by living things at all times. And when we talk about biophilia as a theory that can be implemented, especially for us as building designers, we often refer to it as biophilic design. And biophilic design relies on principles or experiences that we would uh, experience in the natural world. You know, things that you and I might not be particularly conscious of when we're experiencing them, but they do make a big difference. And now categories are best broken up into three, I find. So when we're talking about biophilic design, the first category I want to explain is nature in space. And now nature in space refers to the, the physical presence of nature in a space. So that can be plants, it can be animals, bodies of water. It can be as simple as having access to natural sunlight on your skin, or even just being able to gauge the temperature changes in the day through an open window or natural ventilation. And that's nature in space. And then we have nature analogues. And nature analogues refers to anything that represents something natural. So it can be natural materials such as wood or stone. It can be colours you would find in nature. And it can be um, biomorphic forms, organic forms, patterns, anything that symbolises something natural. And that's nature analogues. And then we've got number three, and that's nature of the space. And nature of the space relates to spatial elements that we would, you know, find in nature. Now, this can be really expansive views. It can be horizons. It can be places of mystery and intrigue. And it can be having places of safety and refuge. So it's where design is constantly looking to nature for inspiration. And that is nature of space. 
And so when we combine these three, we get biophilic design. And when it's done well, we can get some really incredible buildings. I'm going to show you two examples. The first one is Second Home. And Second Home is in Hollywood. It's a co-working space. And straight off the bat, you can see that the top of these buildings looks so organic. It looks like a, a tree canopy. And when you're walking through the space, you are completely surrounded by nature. You can see up here on the right hand side. And you can even see how that path curves around. So, you know, you've got this natural sense of intrigue, what's around the corner. And then inside the space, you have these 360 degree views of, of nature. You get access to natural light and you're also surrounded by natural materials. I think this would be a really productive place to work. And my second example is my favourite building of all time. This is the mountain in Denmark. It is designed by Bjarke Ingels Group and it's a residential building. Now, just to begin with, I will point out the actual literal mountain that's plastered on the side of this building. Probably a bit of a literal interpretation of biophilia, but what you might not expect is that this uh, mountain peak actually covers the car park. So as someone just walking by, instead of looking at this highly industrialised area, you're looking at something that looks more natural. And the material is really shiny, so it reflects the water and it reflects the grass and it actually changes colours during the day as it reflects the sky. So it's this very sort of ephemeral organic um, compound to this building. Just beautiful. Now at the front of the building, this is the really exciting part. The front of the building actually faces a very sort of suburban, highly natural area. So every single resident gets their own garden, they're surrounded by natural materials and they get these wide expansive views. They're facing away from the, the industrial area. And I think this would just be such a uh, empowering space to live. I think it's a really good example of when design is done right. Now, I'm sure you're all looking at your computer screens and going, well, that's great, Matilda, but let's get real, okay? I'm sure it's a fair assumption to say that most of you, uh, including myself, either live or work in places that are probably the opposite to this. And what's even scarier about that is that as Australians, we actually spend 90% of our time indoors. And I actually think that's a statistic that goes sort of global as well. And 90% is a lot of time indoors. And when you think about it, what are we doing between those indoor spaces? Well, if we're traveling from home to work, it's usually commuting. And a lot of us probably aren't lucky enough to be commuting through the countryside. So our commutes look a little bit more like this. It's highways, maybe this is pre and post COVID. <laughs> it's really dense um, public transport. It's, it's these industrialized areas that are, uh, you know, they don't offer any life. So I would really like to just challenge you to stop and think for a second. You know, what is the lack of biophilia in our day-to-day -day lives? Yes. Humans are actually really interesting because we can almost make an endless list of things that make us stressed, right? But do we ever put it down to our designed environments? Has anyone ever been to a supermarket in peak hour? You know, when there's no way to stop comfortably and seek refuge and those floors are plastic and shiny and the the lights are flickering and the air is thick and the noise is amplified and, and you have no idea what time it is. <laughs> you know, these spaces, they make me stress at the best of times. It doesn't even have to be peak hour. And when you're stressed, well, you're actually less likely, likely to make logical and well thought out decisions. And as building designers, we know that we can't afford to not be making logical and well thought out decisions every single day. Or another example, mental fatigue. Now, I know I'm not the only one, but has anyone ever said, you know, I'm just going to lock myself in this room until it's done? You know, when you have like a really big project coming up and you want to meet that deadline and you just want to stare at that computer screen until you've done your job. You're not alone. And I really used to think that looking out of a window or engaging in anything else apart from my computer would result in distraction and procrastination. And the history of office design tells me that I'm not alone. Look at these, they are terrifying. You know, these sort of highly factory-like stores, these angular, repetitive lines, these uh, no access to natural ventilation or, or natural light, bland colours, absolutely no life. If I worked in a space, I would be like this guy, you know, just sort of mic drop, I'm, I'm out, I can't, I can't. <laughs> 
And I know that this doesn't only terrify me because these types of designs have really been shown to increase mental fatigue. So not only is your job going to be harder when you work in spaces like this, but at the end of the day, when you are completely mentally drained, it affects more than just your productivity because mental fatigue affects your awareness and your ability to think clearly and creatively. Now, I'm sure many of you can relate, but when it's a really nice, warm, sunny day outside and I go into maybe like an underground tunnel or, or, or a supermarket or an office with no windows and only to emerge later and it's now cold or it's dark or it's raining, I know that I feel an immense sense of disorientation. You know, there's something clearly not right about being unable to gauge the changes in the day. And I can't gauge the changes in the day if I can't see or smell or, or hear the outdoors. You know, I'm sure many of you have said, you know, it feels like it's going to rain or it smells like it's going to rain. We rely on our senses to gauge the changes in the day and this is really important. And there are some interior environments that shield us from the outdoors in such a way that we actually no longer connect physically or emotionally to nature. And it just doesn't have to be interior environments, unfortunately, because, you know, there might be architectural history and beauty in places like this, but it's all concrete and it's brick and it's cold and the buildings shadow each other and it results in, you know, limited sunlight on your skin and their placement creates these really uncomfortable wind tunnels, you know, with, with not many spaces to seek refuge and, and step aside comfortably. And unfortunately, in a lot of these spaces, there is very limited greenery and vegetation to engage with. It's actually been researched that the less we engage with natural environments, the stronger the disregard for the natural environment. And more the stronger the disregard, the less likely we are to actually feel responsible for it. So in other words, less nature equals less interest in nature equals less caring for nature. And I'm calling this the equation of death because it really terrifies me. <laughs> and that's really super depressing, I'm sure you're all saying. So how do we remedy this? Well, through the use of biophilia. Luckily for us, having vegetation, natural light, natural materials, curved organic shapes and places to seek refuge have actually been shown to lower our heart rate and our blood pressure. There was even a study done on 100 participants who were exposed to differently designed rooms, ones with no biophilic design and others designed completely with biophilic principles. And they found that the participants had an immediate positive reaction to the biophilic environments, and it actually lowered their heart rate and their blood pressure in just the first four minutes of exposure. So if we can actually reduce our stress by implementing biophilia in our designs, well, then we're more likely to make logical and well thought out decisions when we inhabit these spaces. Studies have actually also found that biophilia can have incredibly positive results on cognitive performance. So having the presence of nature can actually improve our ability to think and learn and perform. So if we have access to a horizon and engage with vegetation and are able to navigate the time of day through, through changing light, we actually experience what is referred to as mental restoration. And mental restoration improves cognitive performance, which means we are more likely to be able to think clearly and creatively. So my thought is, if biophilia is implemented in our spaces, and as a result, we have improved cognitive performance, well, then we'd be giving ourselves the best possible chance of thriving. Now we all remember this, less nature equals less interest in nature equals less caring for nature and still absolutely as terrifying as it was the first time. So what happens if we try and reverse it? Now the last and possibly most incredible result that biophilia can have on us is its ability to reconnect us emotionally with nature. And I believe we tend to associate uh, emotional connection with a sense of responsibility. If a way of a simple example, like you would a houseplant or a pet, you would feel emotionally uh, connected to that um, being and, 
as a result, you would feel responsible for it. And how fantastic would it be if just through design, we actually felt more responsible for the natural world? Now, in fact, there have been a few studies to point this being correct. So in 2019, there was actually a metadata study published, and it said that there was a positive and significant association between our connection to nature and our sense of responsibility for it. So bringing nature back into our lives can actually create this opportunity to foster a positive emotional connection with nature every single day, allowing our children and the next generation to stop reserving this type of connection for, for weekends away or family holidays. It's actually been researched that children who develop positive emotions towards nature at a young age are actually more likely to feel responsible for it in adulthood. And that alone motivates me. So it seems that research backs up my hunch. And if we surround ourselves with the natural environment, it could actually directly relate to how inclined we are to protect it. And how do we incorporate this uh, natural environment into our built and designed one? Well, through the use of biophilia. And then the equation looks a bit more like this. More nature equals more interest in nature equals more caring for nature. Because nothing good comes from being stressed, right? Or mentally fatigued or completely disconnected from nature. So let's harness the ability of biophilic design to negate some of those negative and sterile side effects we, we experience from our environments. It will benefit us in more ways than one and it will benefit the environment. Now we all need nature in our lives. We need biophilia. And I know deep down we all feel that pull. We're all in one way or another that super determined little toddler at the edge of the wheat field craving the natural world. Thank you. Thank you, Matilda. That was wonderful. We've got Thank people you. saying how wonderful and great it is. We haven't got any questions, actually. So we've got quite a few people telling us how wonderful the presentation was. So I want to thank you. And also thank you for your shout out today um, that we've seen that on the social media channels. So uh, all of those uh, people online, you can also check out our social media channels on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn to see all of the posts from today's uh, events across Australia. So thank you again, Matilda. Very much thank appreciated. You. Thank you so and, much for having me. 